we're in 2 Corinthians. Let's see, we've made it all the way to verse 15. So let's pick it up in verse 15, and we'll go through the chapter. And this confidence I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by the way of you of, to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and to be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, I, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Father, we thank you. We just continue to worship you. We thank you for that praise report. And God, we just want to uh, praise you via your words. So just help us to surrender our minds. Whatever the day holds, we might make it, we might not. So for right now, help us to focus on your word, that we might learn from your word how to be faithful, because you are always faithful. I pray for the gift of teaching in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in verses 15 and 16, and in this confidence I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on the way to Judea. Judea. So here Paul starts to address what a few people are saying in the church as we're going to go over these verses here. And so we're going to take a little trip through the scriptures. So I hope that you have a Bible. If you don't, please grab a Bible. They're in the chairs in front of you. If you look down, ask someone to hand you one. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because in these verses that we're covering here this morning, some were saying in the church that Paul was unreliable, that he was undependable. Unreliable and undependable. And so... Uh, keep that in mind as we finish up this chapter, and you'll notice what Paul addresses in chapter 11, which we're going to tune to right now, false prophets. So 2 Corinthians 11.10, As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I do also to continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity of those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. We're going to start seeing that there are people in the church that are starting to cause divisions, and they were actually attacking Paul's character, his ministry, his ability to minister, his integrity. And this is not uncommon. This takes place even to this day. People will come into a church, they'll try to find an issue, and then they'll try to uh, enlarge that issue to do what? Well, we'll see, to draw people to themselves. And so this is what Paul is addressing here in verse 13. For such are false prof apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Remember what Revelation tells us? What is the enemy's number one tactic? His number one tactic, Revelation 12, 9, is deception. Deception. He wants to deceive every believer and every unbeliever. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, so not necessarily fallen angels, but men that succumb to his deceptions, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Keep that in mind. God's timing. God will take care of people. Now, we need to do our part. We need to be watchful. 
I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly in this confidence of boasting. See that many a boast according to the flesh. So most likely, these that were coming into the church, most likely, we don't know for sure, but most likely they were probably Judaizers, wanting to take people back to the law, to rituals, to the do's and the don'ts of the Old Testament. And if you fulfill these do's and don'ts, then you'll be loved by God and God will use you. And we know that that is not true. You cannot get saved by works. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you need to make a decision. You've already made a decision, but you need to make a decision for eternity about Jesus. Heaven awaits or hell awaits. There's no in-between. There's no purgatory. There's no nothingness. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. So make sure you make the right choice. It's your choice, free will. I will also boast, for you put up with fools gladly. Now listen to what the church is doing. Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, you're not being aware of what's going on. We'll talk more about it as we go. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. I was with you. I taught you the word. Why are you doing this? For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage. If one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, you put up with all that. To your shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. And so he's going to talk about his pedigree. You can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. So people obviously boast in their pedigree. Uh, if you go over to Israel today, Orthodox Jews, you will see them. They get a check from the government because they studied the word of God. And that's their profession. So the government supports them. But they will not talk with you as a Gentile because you have Jews and Gentiles. Um, if you're a woman, they will gladly cross the street to not have any contact with you, especially a Gentile woman. Uh, when we fly over to Israel, it happens every single time. Uh, 747 will be full and there'll be some Orthodox Jews that are very upset because a woman got seated next to them. And they cannot sit 10 and a half hours on a plane sitting next to a woman. And all of a sudden, everybody's got to make things happen. And can you move? And then there's this big ruckus trying to make everybody happy. And this, that, and the other thing. Because they've got it all together. And they're going to heaven. And you poor people are all going to hell because you don't know God. That's not scriptural. That was not Jesus. In the Old or the New Testament. Uh, we're in junior high on Wednesday nights, we're doing the book of Jonah. And do you know who the Ninevites were? They were worse than ISIS. They would skin people alive. They put hooks in their jaws and hook them to the next person so that when they were marching naked, when they were marching naked, they didn't stop because you would really hurt if you stopped. They didn't fall behind. They would cut people's heads off after they were done mutilating and marching them and they would stack their heads at the entrance of the city. Some cities, when they heard the Assyrians, the Ninevites were coming, would commit mass suicide because they knew what was going to take place. God said, I love the Ninevites. Jonah, go. And what did Jonah do? I'm out of here because I hate them. Jonah eventually went there, but he whined and complained. Even after they got saved, he whined. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were gracious. I knew you'd save them. That's why I didn't want to come here. I want them to go to hell. What's the matter with you, God? Read it. That's what Jonah's whining about. Doesn't sound like Christianity at all, does it? No, we want to be praying for people. Acts chapter 20. We want to be praying for people. Because Paul was making his way to Corinth where he would spend roughly three months. You can find that in Acts chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. He would then turn around, take a land route back to Jerusalem. On his way back, he stopped by Miletus. He didn't want to go to Ephesus, so he called for the elders of Ephesus who came to this seaport town. And he was going to give them some final instructions that possibly give us some insight into the current situation in Corinth. Acts chapter 20, verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So these would be the pastors, the elders. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. 
Keep that in mind. I lived among you, the manner, the way of life, my lifestyle. I lived with you. I didn't live in a, in, in a really nice townhouse and you only saw me on the Sabbath. I literally lived with you 24-7. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me at the plotting of the Jews. And when you see that phrase in the Gospels or elsewhere, it's typically talking about the religious elite of the Jews. Those who wanted to protect Judaism and wanted to kill Christians, which Paul did as Saul. He thought he was accomplishing the will of God. How he kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Gentiles, Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there is the gospel, repentance. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. I'm going to go to prison. The Holy Spirit's making that perfectly clear, but I know I'm to go to Jerusalem, so I'm going. And what does he go on to say in verse 24? But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Guys, in the days we're living in, don't get moved by what's taking place. The pandemic, the state-run media. If you're watching anything, we're already in communism or socialism or a dictatorship. It's not coming. It's already here. The state-run media has been this way for the last three years, propagating certain messages. And if you go click, 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 you'll hear the same phraseology on every single network within a half hour. The exact same terminology is called state-run media. That's what takes place, and that's what is taking place. So, but none of these things move me. Guys, we're just visiting this planet. If gas goes to $20 a gallon, we're just visiting. Let's take somebody with us. Let's take somebody with us. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. Guys, every single one of us, we're in a race. Not against each other. Not against each other. We're to be working together for the kingdom. But we are an individual race. And what that means is you're called to your workplace. I'm not going there. Probably nobody else in this room is going there. You're there. And God has you there for your race. He wants to use you in your neighborhood or with your family members. That's our race. And do it with joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, very important, that ties in with Corinthians. You see, you have received a ministry. As we read these verses here, it's going to look like, oh, he's just talking to pastors. Yes, he's very specifically talking to pastors in these verses in Acts. But I just want to remind you, you have a ministry. Every single one of you, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you have a ministry. There are certain people, it's called your sphere of influence. Those four, six, eight, ten people that are around you, that know you're a Christian. Please don't be a secret Christian. They know you're a Christian. They're watching you. They're listening to you. They're maybe dissecting you. They're maybe ridiculing you, making fun of you. Or maybe they're asking to, for you to pray for them. You have a ministry. Very, very important. <clears throat> so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of gra the grace of God. And indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Very important. Remember that. The whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, pastors, elders, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. A pastor does not own the sheep. We are not to fleece the sheep, and we'll get there in the study. 
But very important, these verses, as you're going through it, just put that in your mind. For the, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. This is happening in Corinthians. Paul. Who's Paul? We're going to read some more verses. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. I just saw an article this morning of a pastor. He's not a pastor. He's, an, he's a demon. He has a demon. He's what we just read about. He lives a gay lifestyle. And he's promoting it from the pulpit. And he's saying, you know, the Bible hasn't changed, but our culture's changed. And so we need to make sure that we read the Bible and, and adapt the Bible to our culture. Mm, no. It's, like, it's happening to this day, guys. It's happening to this day. Therefore, watch. And remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So as we look back into 2 Corinthians, we can see here at this, some point, Paul had made plans to visit the Corinthians in verses 14, 15 and 16, not once, but twice. And I think that he desired to bless them and show them more of God's grace as the word benefit. Notice at the end of verse 15 there, you see that word benefit? You can click on this. It's, you, I'm not a Greek scholar. You can do all this. You can get all the, the tools to do it. When you click on the word benefit, grace. That's what that word means. Benefit, grace, charis, C-H-A-R-I-C-H-A-R-I-S, C -H -A -R -I -S, charis, grace. A second benefit. You see, Paul had come to identify so much with grace, but what was he as Saul? What was he identifying with? The law, the law, the law. Matter of fact, I'm going to kill Christians. That he just desired to shower these young believers with his experience. Yet there appears that there are others who didn't have the deep understanding of grace. And they were questioning Paul's care for the church. Verses 17 and 18. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? That word lightly is fickle. Did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? I don't pray about it. I just kind of go, yeah, I think I'll come visit you. Eh, I don't feel like it this week. Maybe. Eh. Paul prayed. We see that in the scriptures. And he asked for prayer. That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, notice that, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Again, Paul wasn't being casual about his commitment to see the Corinthians. He wasn't just making plans in the flesh. He wasn't a flip floppy type of guy. It appears that some were maybe trying to insinuate that Paul was not a man of his word, that he was wishy-washy. He was vacillating back and forth, but just the opposite was true. Look at chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 7 through 11. He loved them deeply and truly desired to spend time with them. And again, if you're not used to using a Bible, get used to using your Bible. One of these days, your phone's going to be turned off and you're not going to be able to. It's going to be gone. You better be doing that with your pages. Do you not look at, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? So he's talking to the believers at Corinth in dealing with false apostles, false teachers. If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is in Christ, even so we are Christ. Is someone elevating themselves above another Christian? They're a better Christian because they get circumcised? Huh. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave, gives us, gave us for what? Edification building up. That word edification there, architecture. And not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. Again, now notice this. Notice what the false teachers are saying about the Apostle Paul. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily present is weak and his speech is contemptible. 
you're talking about the Apostle Paul that way? Who do you think you are? They thought there was something. They thought there was something because we follow the law. Or we do this or we do that. We'll get more into it. You can obviously hear what the distractors are saying about Paul, but Paul just points back to who the one who ordained his ministry. Look back in Corinthians. But God, but as God is faithful, which we just read some other verses, who put Paul into the ministry? God. He didn't choose there to go there to go him. He didn't choose to go there himself. God put him in the ministry. Some were putting Paul down, but the fruit of his life showed that he was submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see that. Why do I emphasize that? Because distractors will try to point to their fruit. Well, Pastor Jim, you know, he just doesn't have it all. I, I, you know, I got this insight that he doesn't have. Or, you know, the other pastors, they just don't see it like, like this. So let's get together and do a study, and I'm going to show you scriptures that will show you my perspective, which is better than them. Now, they're not going to necessarily say it in those words, but it'll eventually come out that way. They're distractors, they're attacking, and this is what they're doing in the early church. It still happens to this day. 19 and 20, 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen. Amen meaning so be it. Amen, so be it. To the glory of God through us. Through us. You see, God's promises to give us peace. Well, religion will give you, guarantee you, give you peace. But you got to work, 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 work. But that peace can only come through a relationship with Jesus. If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to have peace. You are not going to have peace. God's promises, God promises to give us life and life abundantly. But that type of life can only come through a relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to stress this over and over again, four or five times here. I know you all know this. But guys, this is what we have to stress to other people in our workplace, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members. It's not about punching the clock. What, what Garrett shared, as he was sharing that, I, I'm sure you guys were going, oh, well, that happened in America too. Churches closed down. Some churches have not opened yet. People stopped coming and it was just one of those excuses. Oh, now I don't need to go to church. I can watch it online. And now how many of them are actually watching it online? How many of them are reading their Bibles? How many of them were truly saved? We don't know. It's between God and them. But we want to be very, very careful. God has promised to shower his mercy upon us, but that mercy can only come through a relationship with Jesus. And you might go, this is kind of obvious. Good. Share it with somebody else. God has promised to give us wisdom, but that wisdom can only come through, through reelecting a Democrat or a Republican. Is that the wisdom you're sharing? But that wisdom can only come through a relationship with Jesus. Jesus fulfilled all the promises of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And Paul used those promises to verify that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, the distractors just didn't like the simplicity of the cross. Let's look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Guys, we want to keep Christianity simple. The simplicity of the gospel. 2 Peter chapter 1. And you're going to want to put a piece of paper there or keep your finger there, whatever, because we're going to leave that and we're going to come back to it. So just, just so you know. So 2 Peter 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Same faith, guys. Even though we think of them sometimes as super saints. Same faith. Same weak flesh. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and, our Lord, and Jesus our Lord. As his divine power. Please notice this. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, 
by which have given us, give, been given to us. Notice, past tense. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you have all the promises of God. Now, a health and wealth teacher will go, and now you just need to claim it. Claim that new car. Claim that second house. Claim this. Claim Trash. Totally unscriptural. It's talking about spiritual things. Peace, love, joy, grace, mercy, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. Those things that this world will never have apart from Christ. Never have. You and I can freely have it. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Here's big old fisherman Peter. Precious. It's precious. Praise God. They are precious, guys. They are precious. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Notice that, because we're all born with a selfish nature. If you don't think so, just go help over in the Sunday school. Especially the two and three-year-olds. Because you don't remember what you did when you were two or three. If you do, you're, you're, it's very rare. Most of us do not remember. You stole. You lied. You cheated. Little board games. The grandkids, they cheat. You got to, what are you doing? You weren't there. <gasps> yeah, what? No, you weren't. Now you're lying to me. Get back to where you were supposed to be. Stinking little sinner. <laughs> They're just, we're all sinners. But once we have the Holy Spirit, we can now take on the divine nature through the power of the Holy Spirit, not by our own good works, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit will keep that fleshly nature in check. If you keep wondering why I keep doing the things I'm doing, it's because you're not surrendering your fleshly nature to the Holy Spirit. Because it's guaranteed. We just read it. It's guaranteed that you can get over it. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now again, keep your hand there, or a piece of paper or something. Go back into Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1. Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. You see, it's very subtle, but you can see that Paul is addressing those who said that he couldn't be trusted. Paul points to the fact that it was God who brought them all together in Christ, not himself. You know, sometimes I'll hear people talk and they'll lift up a pastor and they only have to listen to a certain pastor or go to a certain church because that pastor's there. And, and we've seen this even in Calvary Chapel when the pastor goes to Israel or the pastor goes on vacation. All of a sudden, the next Sunday, the attendance will be down. Like he's the only one that can, he's the only one that has the Holy Spirit. We don't do that around here. We've got lots of guys that can teach the word of God. Lots. And the word of God is the word of God. These people who were recusing Paul were actually trying to get people to follow after them. They were the ones who had the answers about God. Paul's word, you know, it's just not dependable. So that means that Paul is not dependable. Paul doesn't argue with them. He just makes the point that it was God who had anointed him to preach. And it was God who has established their faith in Christ. Verse 22 who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit, that would be the Holy Spirit, in our hearts as a guarantee. So we got a verse here, because this guarantee would be an earnest deposit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So right now, you, I, we have a seal on us. And God cannot lose you. And you can't walk away. Yes, you can walk away, but you cannot walk away from your salvation. God's got you. Oh, so I can just go out and sin like crazy? Well, maybe you're not saved. You got that mentality right away? Maybe you're just not saved. Maybe you made a head commitment and you didn't make a heart commitment. Because you made a heart commitment, you're not going to think that way. You're not going to think that way. If you're thinking that way, Mm, you're probably not sealed yet. You need to get saved. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of his glory. So that's talking about eternal security. But in Corinthians, in keeping with the text, I believe it is addressing the ministry. In and of myself, I'm not faithful. If you're new, stick around for a while. I will disappoint you. If you're looking at me, 
to meet your needs, I will disappoint you, guaranteed, because I am just a human, and so are you. You will disappoint me. That's why I don't look at you. I look at Jesus in you. I look at the Holy Spirit working through you. Have very little expectations, and then you won't be disappointed of people. Just have very few expectations. There are those who have made some very serious mistakes, which can discredit the work of our faith. So we need to keep our eyes on the prize and not on anyone might say about us. Pastor Chuck taught us long decades ago, when people talk bad about you, just put your head down and keep plowing. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just keep doing what God's called you to do. They'll go away. They'll go away. The Holy Spirit has sealed us or is guaranteed to finish the work that he has begun. Does that sound like a familiar verse? Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day you die. God will complete the work. So salvation's off the table. Now it's ministry. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be faithful in the race that you've set for me to run. Now let's look back at 2 Peter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 5. But also this, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. Guys, this is what we need today. You know, I, I was grieved this morning and, and Claude and I prayed because I just, the last, I don't know, last 48 hours, I've just been, you know, it's spiritual. I know that. I know that. So don't freak out. Nothing weird is going to happen. But there was just a heaviness and I, and I don't have this very often, but there's just a heaviness on me. I just got to, I just got to stay focused. I just got to pray. I just got to keep adding. And that's my exhortation to you. In these days we're living, it's so grieving. And I don't watch a whole lot of news, but I want to watch enough so I can be educated. But just to listen to these people, watch them look right into a TV camera and lie and lie and lie. And you know it's a lie. I know it's a lie. But they'll still smile like they're selling you a car. This is a wonderful car. I need to get rid of it. Would you buy it, please? Unbelievable. To knowledge, self-control, the self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness. Now, guys, remember, this is right after the Holy Spirit. We're just continuing on with Peter said that you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. You have the divine nature dwelling within you. God wants to help you in all of these things. Don't try to do this on your own. Religion will never be, you'll never be able to do this religiously. You have to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. To godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound. Notice that. Paul's life was abounding in grace, in love, in compassion. He didn't have to defend himself. He just kept pointing to Jesus. Just pointing to Jesus. You know, I'm just fulfilling what God has called me to do. But now notice what Peter says, they're yours and abound. Not just, yeah, but I got it in there somewhere. Really? As a Christian, it's in there somewhere? You're not using it? You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we'll spend hours on conspiracy theories We'll spend hours listening to somebody tell us, the talking heads, what they're going to do, or what they're not going to do. And then we put our trust in that. And sure enough, they fail us. And then we're disappointed or we're depressed or we're this or we're that. Guys, grow in the knowledge. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Gain knowledge the other way as well, but don't put your trust in that. Verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted. Notice that. The believer. Peter is writing to the believer. For the believer who lacks these things, what things? The things we just read, is short-sighted. In other words, we're just focusing on the world. We're not heavenly-minded. And I know that phrase, you know, well, you can be so heavenly-minded, you're no earthly good. It's a really dumb phrase. You can never be so heavenly-minded that you would not be earthly good. Because if you are so heavenly-minded, you're going to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're going to do what? You're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You're going to be really, really involved. So sometimes don't listen to a phrase and repeat it because it doesn't make any sense. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. As we look back up in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 
Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Got a few minutes here. Fellow worker is co-laborer, co-laborer. You see, Paul was willing to come alongside these young believers and help them to understand who God truly was. Because there has been and there always will be those who try to take advantage of young Christians. This is even here in Arizona. There are some churches in which you have to ask a certain person if you can buy a large item, such as a car. This is reality. This actually happens with under the banner of Christianity. You need to approach them about dating someone. It can get to the point where you can hardly make a decision because a certain person in authority over you needs to approve your decision first. You're just not mature enough in the Lord yet. You're just not, you're not there yet. And then when you become mature enough in the Lord, you see through the do domination of their ways, when you leave the situation because of the error of it, they try to make you feel like you've left the faith. You're apostate and your salvation is in question. You don't think that's true? Ask a Mormon if they can leave the Mormon church. I've done it. You ask a Mormon. You see, I, I, I tell them, hey, you know what? I go to Calvary Chapel. And if I want to go to another church, I'm going to go to Rock Point. You know, I'm going to, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to leave Calvary Chapel. I feel called to Rock Point. So I'm going to go to Rock Point. Did I just leave the faith? Am I going to hell now? Well, they don't even believe in hell, so you can't really use that one. But am I, am I not going to make it to the first heaven? How about you? Can you leave the Mormon church and still be saved? Answer, no. Can you leave the Catholic church and still be saved? No. Can you leave Jehovah Witnesses, Islam, these various religions? You leave that, you've left the faith, you're apostate, you're going to hell if there is such a place. Hmm. But once you learn the truth by reading the whole word of God, they no longer have control over you, so they try to cause fear to enter into your life so that you'll come back under their control. You see, it's a sick and bizarre way of operating a church, but unfortunately, it happens. Why? Because people are not reading their Bibles. We'll wrap it up with that. Guys, are you reading from Genesis to Revelation? Daily devotions. Please have daily devotions. Read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Get the word of God in here so the Holy Spirit has something to work with down here. Because if you don't have the word of God in here, what does he have to work with? Just ask yourself that and think about that this week. What does the Holy Spirit have to work with? For me, not a whole bunch. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. And that you've given us your Holy Spirit, the divine nature, that we might take on the divine attributes that you freely give to every believer. Is all we have to do is ask, seek, or knock. And your word says, Jesus says, that my Father will give you more of the Holy Spirit. That we might be able to take on those divine attributes. Father, as we see the world crumbling, as we see our country coming apart at the seams, literally, doesn't matter what network you turn to, it's just lie after lie after lie. Father, thank you that we have the truth. We have the word of God. And if all else fails, we know your word is not going to fail. Your son is coming back right on time. There is going to be a one world government. There is going to be a one world religion. There is going to be a one world economic system and we're seeing it falling into place. So Father, we thank you for allowing us to live in biblical times. Help us to keep looking up. For we are just sojourners, we're just pilgrims, we're just passing through. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh even right now as we pray, Father. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit that as we go out into our mission field, we'll impact people for Christ this week. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Why don't you all stand, guys?